The movement to grant ethical consideration to non-human animals has made important strides in recent decades. Um, since the publication of Animal Liberation by Peter Singer in 1975, a number of academics, activists, and ordinary people have helped to push the idea that animals matter, not just um, when they're cute and cuddly like pets, but um, even in other cases, and make this a serious moral issue. Um, so now we see public discussion of factory farming or animal testing in laboratories or um, mistreatment in circuses or various other um, areas. Um, but there are some domains where animal advocates have not been uh, as thorough in exploring the implications of um, our ethical um, obligations to animals. And one of those is um, insects, and I'll explore that further in this video. Um, so to some extent it makes sense that animal advocates have not explored insects as much because when you're just trying to convince someone to care at, about animals at all, you would focus on primates or cute pets or maybe um, smart farm animals like pigs and it doesn't make sense to um, sound crazy by talking about um, something like insects that most people assume don't matter at all. Um, another reason that animal advocates may not have explored insects as much is because um, they themselves may not be sure if they matter. Um, that's not just because of prejudice um, in favor of cute animals with more human-like faces, but also because insects are simpler. They don't have the same sorts of nervous systems. They don't have um, um, the same sorts of brain structures that um, larger um, mammals and birds do. Um, and so there is some legitimate doubt about how much we should care about insects relative to higher animals. Um, but that's not a reason to totally ignore them, especially since the numbers of insects may compensate for the fact that we might care less about any given individual insect. Um, in particular, there are about a, a quintillion insects on the planet at any given time. That's a billion billion or 10 to the 18. Maybe it's 10 to the 19, something around there. In contrast, there are about um, 10 to the 10th humans on the planet. Um, humans have about 85 billion neurons. That's about 10 to the 11th. Insects have maybe 10 to the 5th or 10 to the 6th. Um, for example, a fruit fly has, uh, has 100,000 neurons. Uh, an ant has 250,000. Bees have almost a million. Cockroaches have about a million. Um, and so we can see there are eight or nine orders of magnitude more insects. Each insect has at most, um, at the difference between insects and humans in neurons is at, at most 10 to the sixth, say. So it's the conclusion is that there are more insect neurons on the planet than human neurons. Um, thus, insects seem uh, a priori to be pretty important. Um, now, counting neurons is not the right measure. Um, if we take a more detailed look because, um, I mean, for example, isolated neurons wouldn't matter at all. They have to be hooked up in the right way. And beyond that, neurons in a small brain might even matter more than um, that same number of neurons in a large brain if the small brain is more efficient or if the small brain is implementing a more holistic um, behavioral um, organismal operation than um, that same number of neurons in a large brain where it's just part of some big cog in the machine. Um, so when we look at it in more detail, we may come to different conclusions um, than just counting neurons. Um, so let's think about that in more depth. Um, some, some people are um, uncertain whether insects um, have any morally relevant um, neural operations. I personally think that um, the things that we care about in terms of consciousness come in gradations and insects exhibit um, lesser degrees of, of characteristics that if they were enhanced with more complexity and um, more refinement in humans, we would care about them. Um, and so insects should matter at least to a lesser degree because they have simpler versions of those same operations. Um, other people disagree and think that consciousness deserves to be considered a, a binary trait of a mind and either it's conscious or not. And in that case, um, you should still maintain some probability that insects are sentient uh, or conscious because um, they at least have crude um, abilities that are similar to ours. They have some of the same um, molecules, some of the same um, neural algorithms. 
um, some of the same substrates and so on. Um, it's true that they don't have a neocortex the way mammals do, or um, some of the brain structures are different, but they are living in the same evolutionary environments and um, they survive very well over millions of years. So they're at least doing something right and uh, it's possible that they have comparable structures or at least structures that perform comparable functions even if they're not the same as what we see in uh, mammals, for example. Um, so there's a lot of, or there's um, not a lot, but there's an expanding literature on the cognitive abilities of insects. And I encourage you to explore it more if you're um, doubtful about this or interested to um, probe your intuitions on it. Here I'll quote just a few articles that touch the surface of this issue, but there's a lot more um, to be explored. Um, so the first article is called Memory from Behavior to Molecules, and this study reviewed um, several different um, papers on learning in um, bees, slugs, snails, leeches, and so on. Um, so this is about invertebrates and not just insects, but probably the, the ideas are similar. Um, the study says as follows, 15 years in studying a wide variety of forms of learning in simple invertebrate animals is quite striking. There is now no question, for example, that associative learning is a common capacity in several invertebrate species. In fact, the higher order features of learning seen in some invertebrates, notably bees and limax, rivals that commonly observed in such star performers in the vertebrate laboratory as pigeons, rats, and rabbits. We have reason to hope that the distinction between vertebrate and invertebrate learning and memory is one that will diminish as our understanding of underlying mechanisms increases. In 2011, Georgia J. Mason um, wrote the following in a, a paper, Invertebrate Welfare, Where is the Real Evidence for Conscious Affective States? Jumping spiders plan routes toward their prey, and hermit crabs show evidence of motivational trade-offs during shell choice. Furthermore, if their brains are implanted with electrodes, garden snails will learn to displace a lever, an action new to their behavioral repertoire, to stimulate those neural regions involved in sexual behavior. None of these represent concrete evidence of conscious emotion, but they suggest that if cephalopods, um, that's like octopi and squids, are now to be protected across Europe, then arachnids, decapod crustaceans, and gastropods should be too. Um, this third and final piece that I'll quote is um, a 2007 article from Discover Magazine called Consciousness in a Cockroach. It uh, reads as follows, or this section reads as follows. To Nicholas Straussfeld, a tiny brain is a beautiful thing. Over his 35-year career, this, the neurobiologist at the University of Arizona at Tucson has probed the minute brain structures of cockroaches, water, brug, water bugs, velvet worms, brine shrimp, and dozens of other invertebrates. From this tedious analysis, Straussfeld concludes that insects possess, quote, the most sophisticated brains on the planet, on this planet, unquote. Straussfeld and his, and his students are not alone in their devotion. Bruno van Swinderen, a researcher at the Neurosciences Institute in San Diego, finds hints of higher cognitive functions in insects, clues to what one scientific journal called the remote roots of consciousness. Quote, many people would poo-poo the, the notion of insects having brains that are in any way comparable to those of primates, unquote, Straussfeld adds. Quote, but one has to think of the principles underlying how you put a brain together, and those principles are likely to be universal. Attention, says Van Swinderen, is a whole brain phenomenon. A thing is not purely visual, not purely olfactory. It's a binding together of different parts that for us signify one thing. Why couldn't the fly's mechanism of attention be directed to a succession of its memories? Yes. That to me is just a, a short hop skip and a jump away from what might be consciousness. Um, in the same article, Christoph Koch um, says the following. He's the chief scientific officer at the Allen Institute for Brain Sciences, and he was formerly a professor at Caltech. He says, we have literally no idea at what level of brain complexity consciousness stops. Most people say, for heaven's sake, a bug isn't conscious, but how do we know? We're not really sure anymore. I don't kill bugs needlessly anymore. Probably what consciousness requires is a sufficiently complicated system with massive feedback. Insects have that. If you look at the mushroom bodies, they're massively parallel and have, and have feedback. So um, there's more to be explored on this topic, but um, it seems clear that we should at least give some weight to the 
possibility that insects matter. And then given the numbers, they may be a very important um, moral issue. Um, so what are the implications? Um, I remember when I first learned that insects might be sentient in 2005, I was kind of shocked for a few minutes afterwards because the implications seemed so drastic. Um, I mean, I was looking at spiders' webs in my basement, and it took on a new level of significance knowing that the um, insects being trapped might be undergoing uh, conscious agony, not just um, um, unconscious reflexive buzzing around. Um, so some people do uh, take insects seriously. I mean, one classic example is the Jain religion from India. Um, Jains um, walk their watch their steps to make sure they don't um, tread on insects. They um, sometimes wear um, masks over their mouths to avoid ingesting insects accidentally and things like that. Um, that it's important to um, not um, take too much effort on the small things, I think, because there are many more insects um, suffering in other ways. Um, but I do, for example, try to um, watch where I'm stepping. For example, if it's raining um, and there are worms crawling on the sidewalk, um, I try to avoid stepping on them, um, or even if it's um, sunny but I see ants or other insects crawling by, I try to um, avoid that. But that's just the beginning, and um, it's important to think about bigger picture implications as well. Um, so humans impact insects in a lot of ways. Um, one obvious example is with agriculture. Um, the, uh, uh, an entomologist friend of mine estimated that there may be um, say millions of insects per hectare of farmland and most of them are killed by insecticides during crop cultivation. Um, but I think it's important to remember that um, insects die naturally as well. Um, insects live maybe a few weeks, maybe a few months if they live to maturity and most of them actually die shortly after birth because there are so many um, born and only a few of those can survive in a, in a stable population. Um, so I think we shouldn't jump from the fact that humans kill lots of insects to the conclusion that we should stop killing those insects. Rather, we need to look at the total amount of insects that are dying painfully and figure out how to minimize that number. So as an example, if um, by spraying insecticides on a crop, um, we prevent insects from living there for, say, a few weeks or a few months afterwards, and that prevents um, many more insects from being born, um, then it's possible that insecticides have actually reduced total insect deaths. Um, this depends on the details, and it's a topic that deserves to be explored further. Um, but it's important not to, not to take um, too much of a deontological approach or an approach of just uh, making yourself pure rather than um, looking at the total picture. Um, I mean, even by living you kill vast numbers of insects every day, um, mostly through the food that you consume, for example, but also just by walking or um, accidentally ingesting some or um, taking a shower and having insects in the shower that get drowned or many other ways. You, walking on the ground crushes many insects. Um, so if, if your goal was only to minimize personal insects killed, then you couldn't really do that um, by living very um, very well. Um, but if your goal is to um, minimize total um, harm to insects, then um, your own existence can um, be very helpful by preventing lots of insect suffering um, in other ways. Um, insects are a tricky issue because there's not um, a lot of theory around how to help them, um, and it's it gets very tricky for the non-trivial uh, cases. So obviously we can not walk on them, we can um, like um, maybe let them outside if they're trapped in a window and so on, but um, when we get to the bigger picture issues of um, insects in the wild, that requires a lot more thought. And not a lot of animal advocates have um, put, put um, their investigation resources into this. Um, so traditionally, for example, vegans do avoid honey um, because they don't want to farm insects. Um, many vegans avoid silk because that involves boiling the silk, silkworms alive when it comes time to harvest them. Um, there's a growing um, movement among ecolog ecologically conscious consumers to um, 
proposed that, that Western consumers eat insects as a source of um, animal protein. And we can um, raise concern about that um, by pointing out that to produce a given amount of meat or given amount of animal protein, you need to consume vastly more insects than you would um, cows or chickens. Um, and insects um, um, and um, insects may not have the same sort of um, humane slaughter um, that, um, or at least attempted humane slaughter that even cows and chickens have. Um, in in many um, developing countries, insects are eaten um, just by frying them or boiling them or um, roasting them or otherwise even just eating them um, plain out of an anthill or things like that. Um, and so um, there's a lot of room for improvement in the welfare of farmed insects, um, if, if it must be done at all. Um, but those are still limited, and a lot of most of the insect suffering in the world happens in the wild. Um, and so that raises bigger questions about what we can do there. Um, <clears throat> it, it gets tricky because we don't want to um, propose moistures that are too radical. I mean, uh, sometimes when people, sometimes when we discuss the problem of insect suffering in the wild, people um, ask if that means you want to eliminate insects, but that would obviously have negative implications for um, a lot of other projects that people care about, and it would impact a lot of people in an adverse way. So we've got to find more um, um, ways to help insects that are better compromises and um, can, can at least reduce insect suffering in a non-trivial way while preserving what people care about. Um, one possibility is to focus on not spreading insects um, in other places, and so that may often mean not spreading habitats, for example, to um, new regions where those habitats don't already exist, or more speculatively to space, or um, um, running computer simulations of insects that are sufficiently accurate as to um, be sentient um, in our evaluation. So. Um, those bigger picture questions are important places to focus, but it's also Im important to remember that um, a lot of times caring coincides with acting, and so maybe the smaller day-to-day -day actions that you take to um, avoid harming insects in your daily, li daily life can um, be a practice that kind of um, instills and reinforces longer-term bigger picture concern for insects. Um, so I think both both parts are important, um, both short-term and long-term big picture actions. Um, and in addition to just cons inspiring concern for insects, I think it's important to um, remind people that um, we want to minimize total insect um, harm, not just the harm that we personally cause. I can certainly imagine that as the insect um, rights or insect welfare movement grows, there may be a big um, push against, say, insecticides, um, because we um, deliberately are killing those insects, but it may miss the fact that it's possible that insects, insecticides prevent more suffering than they cause. Um, and similarly in, in areas of um, um, other, other instances where humans kill insects but maybe um, could uh, cause a net reduction in their suffering. Um, so these are some things to think about, and um, the first step is really to expand the number of people who are thinking about this topic um, and kind of play out the different options for helping insects and challenge each other's ideas. Um, so as the first step, I, I encourage um, people to learn more about it and talk more about it and um, begin probing what we can do to help massive numbers of insects in the wild.